Welcome to the Summit International Music Festival and to today's lecture recital on Chopin's so-called Funeral March Sonata. The way I like to do these events is to use the first half to speak with you about the piece in question and to give you some illustrations on the piano and invite your input at various points. I may pose questions or ask for your feedback and I'll also leave a few minutes at the end of the first half for you to ask any other questions or make any other comments of a more general nature. Then we'll take a short break and I'll come back and perform the entire piece uh, in a concert setting for you. So this is one of four pieces to which Chopin gave the title Sonata. The first piece that Chopin gave the title to was a work he composed while he was a student in Poland. It's a piano sonata in C minor that's very rarely performed. It's considered sort of a, a work of apprenticeship. One doesn't hear it very often. This sonata is his second. There's a third piano sonata, of course, very well known in B minor. And his last essay in the form is the cello and piano sonata, his last large-scale work. So I think the mere fact that Chopin was writing sonatas and entitling these multi-movement works that use sonata form sonatas speaks to his desire to be seen as a composer in the classical tradition, a composer aware of and paying homage to uh, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven before him. And I, I hope we'll also see how Chopin left his own imprint on the form and found ways to personalize it and make it his own. This particular piece was not always well received critically. Okay. Uh, no less a colleague than Robert Schumann, who of course had great admiration for Chopin, wrote this about the sonata when it was first published in 1840. He said, the idea of calling it a sonata is a caprice, if not a jest, for he has simply bound together four of his maddest children. And Schumann went on to talk about a kind of lack of coherence in the work, a lack of coherence in the musical matter, a lack of cohesiveness among the four movements, a sense that they didn't really all fit together. They had just been yoked together uh, by Chopin. Uh, in particular, one thing that troubled Schumann and that troubled a lot of commentators at the time was how short the last movement was. The finale just seemed so short, people took it almost as a sort of joke. Um, perhaps Schumann knew something of the uh, circumstances surrounding the creation of this Funeral March Sonata. This is not a piece that was conceived all at once. Schumann, uh, Chopin actually wrote the piece in two separate bouts. He composed the Funeral March first as an independent piece in 1837 and did not publish it. And two years later, he came back and composed the first, second, and fourth movements to sort of envelop the funeral march. So um, it was not a work conceived in one fell swoop, although I believe that the point of departure, this funeral march at the heart of the piece, was sort of the seed that gave birth to the rest of the sonata. I think there's an enormous kinship between the funeral march, its musical matter, its mood, its uh, technical approaches to composition and to piano writing that if you want to put it morbidly, infect the remaining movements of the piece. Funeral marches, of course, are a musical genre, just like waltzes and uh, nocturnes and etudes and other forms that Chopin turned to. This is not the only funeral march he composed. Uh, early on, he, he wrote an uh, independent funeral march in C minor for piano. His C minor prelude from the 24 preludes is a sort of funeral march. If you know his uh, F minor fantasy, slightly later work. That also begins with a dirge-like funeral march. So it was a genre that Chopin was attracted to. Um, People always ask why, what was it about his life or his sense of mortality that led him to write such morbid music. Uh, a lot can be said. You may know that Chopin was 
suffering from what turned out to be tuberculosis consumption from the time of his late teens. So throughout his adult life, he, he's dealt with illness, sometimes some very close brushes with death. Um, biographers point out that just before composing the Funeral March in 1837, he uh, experienced a huge personal trauma when a woman that he had proposed to, Maria Wodzinska, broke off relations with him and, and, and rejected his proposal. Um, when he returned to the Sonata in 1839 and wrote the remaining movements, he was actually living in rather idyllic settings. It was the summer. Uh, he was spending his time with Georges Sand, his companion and a novelist, in, in her beautiful family estate in the south of France. Uh, but he had been through a harrowing experience the previous winter. Uh, Sand had uh, taken Chopin and her two kids to Mallorca to uh, what she thought was going to be a respite for the chill of the Parisian winters, and uh, turned out to be a huge mistake. Mallorca was chilly and rainy. Uh, Chopin and Sand were ostracized by the locals. Um, the doctors were afraid that his consumption was contagious and they had to pay to have uh, the house they initially rented fumigated. He had no piano. He was getting sicker and sicker. There were reports of his coughing up blood by the bucket bowl. And they eventually, in February, had to leave Mallorca and, and make it back to France where he slowly convalesced. So uh, certainly in the summer, following that experience, he may have been very conscious of this brush he had had with death, and if you want to make those connections, they're, they're easy to do with this piece. Um, so the work begins uh, its composition with what wound up being the third movement, this funeral march, and I think we should start looking at it from there. I'm going to play for you the first phrase of the funeral march. I'm sure it's a work everybody will recognize. And then I invite your comments. I want you to think musically what does he do? What does he do musically? What does he do technically that makes this music sound like a funeral march? In so many, on so many levels, the repeated B flats on the top voice, this sort of twirling minor third in the bass that never moves, this chromatic half step in the middle voice, and one of the signatures of, of any kind of military or martial uh, composition is the dotted, the long. Uh, um, and that, that sort of would have been a signal that people were hearing some kind of a march. So those are all very important things. What else? Does it sound funereal? Death-like. Yeah? Somehow or other, it reminds me, I guess people call it the, the, rain, the raindrop. Yes. Something? 
Yes. Well, and the Raindrop Prelude, he had composed shortly before this in that Preludes he worked on in Mallorca. And uh, actually, we think that Raindrop Prelude was, was not the one that we always call the Raindrop. We think the Raindrop Prelude was this one. But, but, but the one everybody means is the... But the point is this predilection for repeated droning notes. Uh, absolutely. Um, I think the element of repetition permeates the way this march is put together. It's, there's a deliberate monotony. It sort of breaks down into these two measured long units, some of which are simply the same thing played twice. One measure, same exact thing. Next two bar unit starts the same way. and that's part of what characterizes the music. Um, when composers of tonal music, by tonality I mean the system of major and minor harmony that existed since the late 17th century, when they establish the key of pieces in, the usual way is to show some kind of dominant tonic relationship, some kind of progression that would show the tonic in relation to the dominant, he never does that in the first phrase. I mean, there's no question that it's in this key, but he sort of establishes it in a very primitive way, in an almost ancient way, in a way that predates tonal music, in a way that sort of recalls ancient chanting or maybe folk music. You, you just have this note, the B flat, droning endlessly in the bass, never gets off it. It even becomes difficult to say how the melody comes out of the accompaniment. I mean, if you think of Chopin as this supreme melodist, this composer of piano music who knew how to imitate operatic writing better than anyone in his nocturnes and in his pursuits and so many of his piano pieces, this piece in some ways seems kind of anti-melodic. The melody here and in much of the rest of the piece almost seems to have to fight for its life, for its independence from the accompaniment. And, we, and there are some things very concretely that he does to make that happen. The lower voices, which just do this, sort of give the set of notes that the melody is spun out of. So, elaborating what's been going on all the time. Even when he does, he's really just going from here to here, which is the same as here to here, just flipped upside down. And all of these notes are present in the accompaniment. So it's a kind of writing where the accompaniment and the melody work with the same sets of notes. And there's, there's a technical term for that. We call that heterophony. It's something that 19th century romantic composers were very interested in in their piano writing. You find it throughout Chopin's work, also in Schumann and, and, and so on. And I think in this piece, he puts it to this very kind of morbid, shadowy use where you, you sometimes can't even tell, is that an introduction? You know, is this an introduction to, to the melody, or is it the beginning, uh, and, and so on. From this point on, Chopin finally, into the major key. 
makes it disturbing um, is the way Chopin switches registers. You know, will suddenly introduce a higher voice or a lower voice and then just leave us dangling, create harmonic dissonances and just leave them unresolved, like when he writes. snare drum roll in a military procession. first part, it has a contrasting middle part, and then the first part gets played all over again. And the middle part, on the surface, seems like a total contrast, a total relief to the doom and gloom of the funeral march. sort of interpolated into the middle of this march. It's a total digression, almost a fantasy. Some might hear in it a, a vision of heaven, a, a sentimental reminiscence about the deceased. Um, if we look at it a little bit more closely, though, this tune that begins with F, G flat F, comes out of throughout the start of the funeral march. So there is a very deep, unconscious unity that knits this all together. I also wonder if Chopin wasn't thinking of Mendelssohn, Schumann, Liszt, Wagner, later Brahms. Uh, Chopin is the one least influenced by Beethoven, least in awe of Beethoven, least admiring of Beethoven. But, and, and I'm not, I don't know that that's totally accurate, but that's the perception. One exception, though, was Beethoven's 12th piano sonata, the one that, interestingly enough, contains a funeral march of its own, and which was unquestionably a model for Chopin in this piece. 
uh, it was one of the few Beethoven sonatas that Chopin taught very often, is known to have performed. The layout of its four movements are exactly the same as the layout of Chopin's. The Funeral March is the third movement uh, in the Beethoven as well. Um, has many similar characteristics. section of Chopin's funeral march is this kind of idyllic dream, this sort of... escape. This is what Beethoven writes in the middle section of his funeral march. Sulla morte di un eroe, or March on the Death of a Hero, and, and Beethoven seems to be recalling heroism in his funeral march rather than giving this more intimate sense of grief and, and, and memory that Chopin does. Chopin, in fact, ends his funeral march just as he began. Some people call it an introduction. 
the home key. When it first starts, we don't quite know where we're headed. So it sort of fulfills part of the role of what we expect an introduction to be. And in Chopin's day, in fact, there was a whole tradition of what people called um, preluding. Pianists would typically sit down and improvise a little bit before playing a large-scale work. They would often start by noodling around and, and gradually work their way to a cadence in whatever key the big piece was supposed to be on. So, this might have almost reminded people of that tradition. However, I think if one looks and listens more closely, there are connections, even in this seeming introduction, to the funeral march and to the notes and the intervals that that movement is based on. This opening, a descending sixth, and an ascending se uh, minor second, is really the same intervals as the minor third of the funeral march with its rising third and descending second just turned upside down. So it's really just an inversion. from the substance of the funeral march. What does he go on to write? Even this, which one might initially think is just an accompaniment, the notes. It's the, the B flat, D flat of the funeral march. And when the top line comes in, those are the notes. So remember what I said before about heterophony, about the melody and the, and the accompaniment coming from the same set of notes. It's exactly what they do here. And it becomes almost impossible to say, is this where the melody started, or did it start back there? Is this an introduction, or is it the start of the melodic material? It's vague. It's sort of like it's struggling for life. It is sort of the life force. Uh, even where I left off playing for you. contrary to what Schumann said, a very coherent work. We're still kind of left with this question, are these first four bars an introduction, or are they something else? And I would argue that they're not really an introduction, but that they become so important in the way the whole movement develops. Um, at the climax of the development section of, of this first movement, he writes this. 
one part of the opening theme with the introduction is sort of combining them here at this very climactic moment. So I would say that what you hear at the beginning of the sonata is very important material, even though it's slower and it seems to be introductory. Um, a lot has been said about the way this sonata recapitulates without the first theme. When you get this sense of homecoming, when Chopin writes, dispenses altogether with the first theme in his recapitulation. Um, I would say a few things about it. In some ways, as I said before, this is Chopin paying homage to the tradition of Beethoven, Mozart, and Haydn, and the way he works up to this recapitulation with a huge preparation, it's basically like he takes that cadence and stretches it out. with that kind of passage. But I think uh, starting the recapitulation with a secondary theme was actually a very early classical tradition. It was something that harkens back to early Haydn and before. And um, maybe Chopin felt he had done so much with the first theme in the development section that he didn't need to bring it back yet again at the beginning of his uh, recapitulation. Hard to know. If you know Mozart's little C major sonata, He does something similar. It starts in the key of C. When this melody comes back, though, it's in a different key. It's in the key of F. And it's not until it's not until um, he gets to the second theme in the recapitulation that he actually comes back to the home theme of C major. So for what it's worth, Chopin very much steeped in the classical heritage in, in, in spite of his romanticism. Um, this issue, though, of introductions and what's really an introduction brings up a, a question of texts that I want to share with you. Did most of you uh, get the handout? Uh, I, uh, I'll see if I have a spare copy. Does everybody else, or nearly everybody else, have it, or the ability to look um, Before we before we actually look at this, I just I want to throw out a, a question to to everybody. Um, when we make an edition, a printed edition of a piece that was composed in the in the distant past, a piece by Mozart, Chopin, a composer who lived two hundred years ago or more. How do we do it? If you had to do it, if you had to prepare a printed edition of a piece by a composer long deceased, what sources would you use to make sure that what you print, what you give people to learn the music from, is as close as possible to what the composer wrote or intended? Yeah? Would you try to go back to an early manuscript Possible, as as so I think that's a very, very good point of departure. If you can find what we call the autograph, the actual handwritten piece of music that the composer wrote, uh, that would be a very wonderful resource. It would be very close to the composer. Sometimes we can do that, and sometimes that's what it comes down to. Sometimes it's more complicated than that. Sometimes there may be many autographs floating around. A composer may have written out multiple copies. And they may not all agree with each other. 
Sometimes there are handwritten copies made by other people. Because remember, we're talking about the days before Xerox machines and computer programs and finale and, and faxes and everything. And if you needed to make a copy of something, it meant you were doing it by hand. So for example, in the case of Bach, lots of manuscripts, handwritten copies by pupils, by children, by wives, uh, and they don't always agree in every detail. So it gets more and more complicated. What else? What else could you look at? It would take you close to the composer. Could you look at performance? Or if it's too far? You mean if, if uh, the composer? The person? Yeah, yeah, the way, he, perhaps the way the composer played it, or perhaps the way somebody that he chose. But yeah. Thought, but maybe, I, I mean, of course, if we go far enough back into the past, there are no recordings. So that, that becomes a problem. Chopin didn't survive long enough to see Edison invent his talking machine. Uh, but people do say, well, this person was a student of a student of Chopin's, and they say this is the way it was supposed to be played. Could, it could be useful? The earliest published scores because they're close to the composer? Yes. So early editions, sometimes, even if we have the autograph in the composer's handwriting, the piece was also published while they were alive, and the composer approved the printed edition, and it might even reflect revisions and corrections that make it more close to what the composer intended than the handwritten copies. But again, lots of dilemmas when, when all these things don't agree. Um, are there any other ideas about resources? Maybe, you know, the, the style of that composer, like Mozart, you know, use six. Well, absolutely. What we know about performance practice, those traditions are, are, are going to be very important to how we interpret what we see, how we interpret what they wrote down, for sure. Um, Chopin becomes especially problematic in terms of editions um, for several reasons. Um, Chopin had publishers uh, in several different cities. Th this was before the days of international copyright and performance rights where you would you know, get a royalty every time your piece was performed. Um, composers could and often felt that they had to publish their music in different countries to protect themselves in each case. So Chopin tended to have most of his pieces published more or less simultaneously in France, in England, in London, and in German-speaking uh, city-states. I mean, most often he would have them published in Leipzig, but there are a few cases like Vienna or whatever. So typically, you'll have his music published in three different places at the same time. And in order for those publishers to print up his music, they would need something to work from. So Chopin handled that in different ways. Sometimes he would actually write out a copy to send each publisher. And we have cases where on the same afternoon, he copies out the same piece to send to a different publisher, and there are differences. So every time he wrote, he was creative, he was changing, he was amending, he was finding alternatives, other ways of doing things. So that becomes very problematic. Um, sometimes the publisher in France would be the one to get to work off of Chopin's own handwriting, but he would have a student make a copy that would get sent to another publisher. And then maybe he would get a proof sheet from the French publisher to, to check and correct. And that would get sent to a publisher in England, let's say, as a basis for that edition. It gets very complicated. Uh, Chopin was a, uh, a very active teacher. And we have lots of uh, examples of the music of his students that they, they studied with him, with his own corrections. And he's saying, oh, no, there should be a sharp sign there, or you should make a crescendo here. So suddenly, there is this whole other tradition of, of the way Chopin taught his music that becomes available. So it becomes very, very hard in the case of Chopin to pin him down to exactly what he wanted on the printed page. Um, and the case of this sonata is particularly interesting. The music was published first in 1840. The edition that came out in Paris was based on Chopin's own autograph, his own handwriting, but that hasn't survived. It's gone. But we can look at the French editions that came out in 1840 and assume that they're very close to Chopin's autograph. Um, 
four times there were, there were printings of this first edition, just in the first year, and they're all, they all reflect corrections and little changes made, some, some by Chopin, some corrections by the publisher. The edition that was printed the same year in Leipzig was prepared from a handwritten copy by one of Chopin's students, uh, and it's a little bit different. And then there's an edition that came out in London that was based on one of the French prints. Um, and what I gave out to you are like the first two lines of the sonata. Um, the top, these are both modern editions, but the top is more or less the way it appeared in the French printing, based on Chopin's autograph, and the bottom is the way that it appeared in the German edition, uh, based on a um, copy made by one of his pupils. And if you look closely, I mean, there, there are some little differences. There's one glaring difference, though, one, one very significant difference. And anyone can tell me what that is. The D in the third mark uh, measure in the top line. Third measure. You mean that it's written in the treble clef in one and then it's written in the bass clef? Mm -hmm. it, it is a different notation. But it's the same note. That's true. It's true. It's a difference. There's something even more significant. Um, if you look at the fourth into the fifth measure, of both versions, what do you see at the end of the fourth measure in the bottom one? the bar lines, and you get to one, two, three. The fourth one is a double bar, right? And what, and what are those little dots right after it? Pardon me? It's a repeat sign. Do you see that on the top one? OK, that's a big deal, I think. So what happens is, later on in the movement, Chopin comes to the end of his exposition, and he puts the two dots, that means repeat. And us, we musicians know that that means either you go back to the beginning of the piece, or to the place where you see the repeat, the, these dots going the other way, right? So that's gonna make a big difference. If, there are no, if those two dots aren't there, it means you go back to the beginning. If you see the two dots, it means you go back to the fifth measure. So that's a radical difference. It so happens that almost every modern edition and almost every modern performance is based on the German edition. And people think that that's where you should take the repeat from and that the first four measures are just an introduction that you hear once and you don't need it again. But it's probably a 170-year-old printer's error. And the piece winds up sounding very, very different and really meaning something very different if you fix it. If the exposition, the first part of this first movement, ends this way. And if you do what the German edition says, this is what happens. You go back there. It doesn't sound right to most people. something is wrong. So a lot of people don't even bother to repeat. A lot of people just go on with what comes next. If you go back to the beginning, I actually think it sounds just right. I think this is meant to resolve there to the D flat. And it makes total sense. And then something else kind of comes into focus. When people say, well, it has a slow introduction and then a fast main section, if you look exactly at what he writes, at the beginning he says grave, which means very slow, grave. And then on the fifth measure he writes doppio movimento, which means, what do you think? Second. Doppio means double. double speed, twice as fast. But if you take him literally, not just slow and fast, but if it literally means twice as fast, suddenly everything kind of works out. Thank you. 
make sense. It's not so much that the tempo changes, it's that the counting changes, but the pulse is consistent. And the ending of the exposition goes right back into the introduction. It's an introduction, but it's also a transition, and it, and it works perfectly. But you almost never, ever, ever hear it because of that printer's error. But you will hear it today if you come back. Let me just say a few things briefly about the second and fourth movements, and then we'll take our break. Um, the second movement of this sonata is marked scherzo, and you may know scherzo is Italian for joke. And it used to be a kind of lighthearted, uh, lightweight, fast, virtuosic movement in the, in the music of Beethoven, for example. Chopin, of course, transforms the meaning of the word. His scherzo is rather driven. described it as the left and the right hands gossip with each other in unison after the march. But I think the even more famous quote is by the Russian pianist and composer Anton Rubinstein who said, it's the wind over the grave after the mourners have departed. Um, let me play through the beginning. The funeral march ends. 
intelligible to us. He asks for it to be played all sotto voce, in an under voice, all legato, all smooth. Um, there's only one dynamic marking apart from that instruction. There's one crescendo in the whole piece. There's one phrase marking, but otherwise he leaves it kind of blank, leaves it to us. Um, I think beneath the surface, there's actually something very rational going on. This is actually a little sonata form. The opening four measures are an introduction. especially the way Bach could write these incredible uh, works for unaccompanied cello, violin, flute, where even though he's writing one note at a time, he's suggesting harmony in many voices just because of how he spaces the notes. You can hear in Chopin's world of notes, there are harmonies that are being traced, right? You can hear that your ear tells you it's really... notes to hang on to, to make it intelligible when he writes. You kind of hear what's underneath the swirl of notes. Um, in the end, when he writes, He's really writing. He's writing out something based on. That motif from the funeral march, but it's now thickly embroidered with lots of passing notes. The voice leading is sometimes a very. so much from from a single line could imply so many voices and so much harmony with just note after note. So Chopin, I think in this sonata and in all of his great works, both situates himself as part of a classical tradition, but in totally new, wonderful, innovative ways. I'm happy to take your questions and comments now and then. We'll take a little break and I'll play the piece for you. Yes? You analyze this music very clearly. In the process of composing it, do you think Chopin thought of it in the same terms or was it just intuitive and instinctive? Well, I think this is always the question. Um, how do geniuses work, right? Uh, and how come we lesser mortals can spend infinitely more time analyzing and trying to figure out their music or their writing or their painting or whatever than it took them to create it? So my guess is that a lot of it was intuitive. A lot of it was unconscious. It's just part of what makes a genius a genius. No doubt, Chopin was immersed, we know he was immersed in the music of Bach and, and his classical predecessors. He, he had the erudition, he had the, the knowledge, but how it all combined, I think, went on in his unconscious to a large extent. That's my belief. Other observations about music? Yeah? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even realize that with his 
pieces they have. Like, so in common it has with um, Facebook, you know, I didn't even like realize that until now. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and the, the Beethoven Sopo Funeral March Sonata was also a revolutionary piece. It's, um, it was written around 1800, you know, the time when Beethoven first realized he was losing his hearing. And it's his, the 12th of his 32 sonatas. And it's a very unconventional work as well. It's in four movements, but not one of them is a sonata form. The first movement is a theme and variation, then a scherzo, then the funeral march, then a kind of rondo. So it's, it's also a revolutionary work, and it was obviously really important to Chopin. Um, 